Welcome everyone to today's talk. The, the, the title is The Importance of Seed Quality in International Seed Trade. It is the third talk of a series targeting to promote agrobiotechnology and enhance understanding of the potential application of agricultural products. We hope that this series will inspire international scholars, researchers, farmers, and business in the agricultural field as well as the interested public. First, let me introduce our speaker, Dr. Anthony Che. He is currently the chairman of Clover Seed and Hong Kong Seeds Trade Association. He studied horticulture at the University of California in the United States and obtained a PhD degree in plant physiology. During his undergraduate study, actually he was a pioneer successfully conducted Phalaenopsis orchid propagation using tissue culture. So Anthony is actually the, one of the first who can do the tissue culture of orchid to produce new orchid flowers. Anthony returned to Hong Kong in 1975 to continue developing his father's seed and trading business named Clover Seed. The company started importing and exporting contract production of hybrid vegetables and flower seeds in China for foreign companies since mid-1980s. Through, through, through this process, he has introduced a new dimension of agriculture to the farmers in Northwest China. After many years of cultivation, Hexi Corridor has become a major area of seed propagation in China. Meanwhile, the technological advancement also improved the incomes of the farmers there. Anthony, who has served as the president in the Asia Pacific Seed Association from 1997 to 1998, has established an extensive network in seed industry, both regionally and internationally. The Cova Seed Laboratory was launched in year 2007, focusing on market development and plant pathology. Understanding the importance of farmers to the world, Cova Seed strive to improve farmers on farm efficiency and provide a steady supply of good quality seeds and better products. In the following presentation, he is going to introduce the international definition of high quality seeds and discuss the importance of these seeds to international seed trade, economic value, agricultural productivity, and environmental impact. Now, please welcome Anthony to the floor. Anthony, please. Oh, well, good evening and good day to everybody. Uh, I'm very glad to be here to present my talk on the importance of seed quality in the international seed trade. Seeds are living objects and essential in today's agriculture, that is our food supplies. It is internationally traded and its breeding, processing, trading is highly globalized. Several advanced countries are specialized in breeding. They're mainly concentrated in North America, Europe, and Japan, and some in China and India. Uh, usually, the breeding is not only done in the home country. They may have offshore breeding station to increase the generation's time, or maybe they have testing facilities all over the world so that they can test seeds specific for those areas. Seed production is done in areas with the best 
climatic conditions. And also as important as disease free, as we will find out later. And also for some crops, it's very important that there is available labor. Processing usually is done back in the breeding countries and shipped back to the original country and ship all around the world. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about labor intensive crop first. These are either hand pollinated crops. These are hybrid crops that need to be hand pollinated. Uh, this includes so the nation's crops like tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, cucurbits, cucumbers, squash, gourds, watermelon, etc., and certain flower crops. These crops need hand emasculation and pollination and extremely labor intensive. Uh, the slide show uh, hand emasculation of tomatoes in India in India. And the next slide shows uh, the working in uh, pepper fields. Another dimension of crops that needs hand labor is to hand harvesting the seeds to ensure extremely high germination, like carrots and onions, because these crops, they have Besides the primary flower, they have secondary and tertiary. And they, need, they do not mature all at the same time. And if mechanically harvested, the, usually the germination <coughs> is not as good as is being handpicked <coughs> as they mature. So I show the uh, extracting pollen and uh, eggplants. So very labor intensive. These are hybrid tomato production fields in Northwest China and hybrid watermelon. And you can imagine each fruit is the result of hand emasculation and hand pollination. And it's extremely labor intensive and so far, there's no other means of doing it. And places where labor is available and reasonable price are very limited. Uh, so far, India, China, Thailand, and some in Chile. Uh, not only lab labor, laborers, has to be available. They have to also have the right climatic conditions to do the seed production. And from my experience working in seed production in Northwest China, this is an extremely good way to improve the livelihood of the local people. And we are able to create employment for the local people and particularly women. And the, is a very good way to elevate property. Property. So we can see the seed production can be done in different countries. The breeding is only in the field of advanced countries. And the processing maybe go to go back to the breeding countries and sales can be anywhere. So I'll show, the next slide shows how seeds are traded all around the world. It's like a web that goes everywhere. And when you buy seeds from, say, Holland, that doesn't mean the seeds is produced in Holland. It can be produced in many possible other countries. And similarly, seeds in America or Japan. So this shows how seeds have moved all around the world and the situation is very complex and because seeds is so important in agricultural production the trade is highly regulated to ensure high quality 
the total seed exports, according to ISF in 2018, is 5 million tons, or worth 13 billion US dollars. It's not very important compared to industrial production, but if you look at seed as maybe one or two percent of agricultural production, the seed trade is actually affecting, you know, basically the world's crop production. Uh, many open pollinated crops, particularly the cereal crops, rice, wheat, houses, are still either farm safe or done by government institutes and distributed to farmers domestically. So these numbers are not included in the seed trade numbers. But a lot of the hybrid crops like corn, sunflower, rice, some of the vegetables and flowers, these are done mainly by private companies and traded. <clears throat> oh, we will look at how seeds are regulated. And at the same time, the seed companies are very self-disciplined. They, they themselves will ensure that, most of them will ensure the quality of the seeds they sell, because otherwise they are liable to economic claims. First quality that will come into anybody's mind is germination. Seeds are used for growing, and unless they germinate, they're basically useless. And usually we expect 90, 85%, and more and more now for the vegetables, we expect 90% or even 95%. And this is physically achievable. And, and not only with germination, we are also looking seriously at bigger. Because today, more and more crops are transplanted, and farmers are not buying the seeds, they're buying the seedlings. So it demands very high germination to give very uniform stand or seedling. Abnormal seedlings, seeds with poor radical, are counted out as they will not make normal, useful seedlings. And uniform germination within a limited time frame is also important and necessary. Moisture content. This is highly related to the shelf life of the seeds. Unless the seeds are dry to an acceptable moisture content, the shelf life will be affected. And usually that needs to be lower than eight or seven percent. Physical purity. Seeds should be only seeds and nothing else. Soil particle, rocks, broken seeds, other inert materials should not be there. And very important is the presence of noxious weeds because that will contaminate the farmer's bills. And today, this is a very important item. And many countries will inspect, particularly for noxious weeds, and anything contaminated, it will be rejected. And normally, we expect the seeds to be 99% pure. Genetic purity. So this is to assure that what you are purchasing is what you're paying for and nothing else. And for many OP crops, there are, certi there are certifying agencies to verify this, and we will get into this after a little bit later. And for hybrid crops, it's usually up to the seed companies to assure this. And depending on the crop, we expect this to be at least 98%. So seed health is also a very important aspect of seed quality. Seeds are living objects. 
and they can carry and transmit certain seedborne diseases. It's essential that does not happen otherwise. Serious economic losses can occur, and seed companies are legally liable for this. And particularly for countries or areas where these diseases are not present. There need to be very high safeguards to make sure clean seeds are only imported. Not all diseases are transmitted through seeds, but some of the more serious ones are like black rot in brassica, bacterial foot loss in cucurbits, and this has been extremely serious in recent years. Tomato brown recruits food virus. This all of, a sudden, all of a sudden show up in Europe in two years ago, and it's all over the world now. Uh, bacterial cankers in tomatoes. Uh, CGMMV in cucurbits. LSO in Umbilaceae and Solanaceae. So this, the slide show the symptoms in carrots. It can really affect the yield of the carrot crop. So seed companies are responsible to make sure seeds do not carry these diseases. So there are different ways of doing it. First, it's very important they produce some clean stock seeds. So to make sure the parental stocks are clean, otherwise they will be carried on to the next generation and producing in disease-free areas. And sometimes some diseases can be taken care of by effective seed treatments after harvest. This can be treated but with chemicals like acids or leeches or by heat treatment. So if it can be done, that will be the best thing. So all these quality issues are responsibility of the seed companies. And it is really their responsibility to make sure their products are up to standard. And most owners and responsible companies will do so. And at the same time, their international agency that will certify these to kind of be the safeguard for the trade. So first is the ISTA, the International Seed Testing Association. So ISTA is the association founded back in the 20s to come up with standard procedures in the field of seed testing. So main purpose is to make sure that we, there are same standard protocol in from the sampling to the testing of the seeds so everybody can come up with uniform results so they have member labs in over 80 countries and it's a truly an international network the vision is to come out uniformity in seed quality evaluation worldwide the members work together to achieve this vision and they produce and publish international agreed rules for seed sampling and testing. They accredit laboratories, promote research, provides international seed analysis certificates, training, and disseminate the knowledge. So this is very important and contribute to our food security. ISTA has 130 approved labs all over the world. They are credited to issue orange or blue certificate to certify the germination, moisture content, and the purity of the seeds. In addition, they issue certificates stating that seeds are free from specific seedborne diseases. And not only that, they work together with all the seed technologists to develop standard protocol 
to test for seed health for each and every specific disease. And with all these new diseases coming up, this is extremely challenging work. Uh, many times, people would prefer to use a molecular biology te te technology, but uh, PCR methods. But the problem with PCR methods is we can come up with false positive. And, and for some of the new diseases, there are simply no tests. So it depends largely on field inspection. So many countries will require the importation of seeds to be accompanied by orange or blue certificates. So ISTA is responsible for the seed quality, but the seed purity they, it's not their responsibility. So to certify the genetic purity of seeds falls under the OECD seed scheme. So they have system of certifying agricultural seeds. So it's a system of certifying agricultural seeds so that they are consistently of high quality. They produce under officially controlled conditions according to a set of harmonized procedure put in place in 61 participating countries. So most of the important agricultural countries are within the scheme. So membership open to OECDs, UN and WT, World Trade Organization countries. The aim is to stimulate the production and use of high quality seeds. There are eight schemes, each defined according to a group of specific cultivated plants, and more than 200 species or all. So they divide it into grasses and legumes basically the forest crops, the cruciferae and others and fiber species, cereals, corn, sorghum, sugar beet and folder beet, clover and similar species and vegetables. So they, they do have a system to inspect seed productions and certify the seeds are true to type and they will issue certificates at each bag of seeds are usually sealed by the tech. But for many vegetable crops, particularly vegetable crops, it is up to the individual seed companies to do their own laboratory or field grow up tests. In the lab, it's mainly by PCR tests. And actually, the PCR te tests will usually involve two or more markers and are more accurate than actually field grow out, uh, field grow out tests, and also a lot more in time saving. So those those two are mainly the certifying agencies. So we have to have the policeman in safeguarding the movement of seats, and with as you see earlier, the movement of seeds all around the world is very rapid and important. So each national country has their own system of safeguarding their own borders to make sure there's no diseases to come in with the living material, not only with seeds, but with all living material. So this is but within that, there's the IPPC, the International Plant Protection Convention. So they, they are a worldwide organization of all the foreign countries. 
and they their aim is to protect the plant resources and to stop the spread of pests and promote safe trade. So the convention come up with ISPMs, the pre standards for phytosanitary measures. They meet time to time and come up with these measures to safeguard and to catch up with technology in the, in the world trade of the plants. It's not only seed set, but any plants. So they will come up with conditions for if there are some new diseases, they will set up new criteria. And each country is, is responsible for their own. So that is a very integral part of the World Trade Organization. Because it's also very important that each and every country do not use quarantine issues to stop the fair trade of seed. So the National Plant Protection Officer, the NPPO, that is the officers in charge of the phytosanitary service. They will set up import requirements of seeds into their own country. And they will issue import permits and issue export certificates for the exports. So for import permits, they will list out the criteria that they expect. And that can be more than just saying the seats are clean. And there will be required requ special decoration for many special diseases. So this is uh, what we can see is that these are important in today's agriculture because for any plant crop production, we start with the seeds. And seeds are widely traded all over the world and produced all over the world where it is best and of the highest quality. And seeds needs to be of high quality to ensure successful production. And seed trade is governed by different international organizations. And seed companies are, because of the economic liability, they are self, more or less self-regulated. So this is all I have to say tonight. Okay, so um, Anthony has left us a lot of time for discussion. I think the, his presentation is very to the point and has a uh, point to very important issues related to seed trade and seed quality. I'm sure that some friends will have further questions to ask. But before that, um, I would like to invite everybody to take a photo first. <laughs> <laughs> so to make, to make a record of today's event. So if you don't mind, please turn on your camera. And yeah, and our members will take a Zoom photo for everybody. Oh. Hi, May, I can see you now. <laughs> Joanna, I, so. uh, everybody ready? Okay, who is going to take photos? Yeah, when you stand there, let us know, okay? Done? Yeah? Oh, okay. So, okay, ready? Okay, okay, so now we can start our discussion session. So please feel free to ask your question 
just unmute yourself or you can type it in. Uh, Anthony, may I ask, uh, oh, over all these years that you're trading on the seeds, what are the major issues in, you encountered internationally for trading the seeds? Major event that you can recall? Well, uh, a lot of the problem is, uh, you know, whether we can ship the seeds or not. And as you see, the complex of the trade where production and breeding and trading are all done in different countries. And many countries, you know, the, the phytosanitary offices can come up with all of a sudden a new disease. And, but the seeds is already produced and certified. And we did not know about this new disease. And so all of a sudden the seeds are produced, but we cannot ship. Uh, I can give you an example. It's the recent case of the, the brown recruits virus in tomatoes. All of a sudden, Europe and America has found this disease and needs extra certification to seeds to be free of this disease before they can receive it. So we are stuck. The seeds we produce have not been certified. So we have to wait another year to produce the seed and have it certified in order to ship. And meanwhile, the business come to a standstill. And these things happen very often. And, but, but this is beyond our control. And with climate change, new diseases are coming up every day. And also with better technology, we, today we are a lot away of seed health than say 30 years ago. 30 years ago, you ship seeds anyway, because we don't know any better. But today, because of technology, we, we can detect the disease and there's no reason that we should be shipping them all over the world. So that means when this happens, that your financial risk is very big. You are certainly right. But there's no, no, no way to rectify it fast. Uh, certainly. So like all the tomato seeds we produce from, for America, because they are not certified to be free of this tomato brown recruits virus. So we just have to destroy it. Oh. Okay, I have a question myself. So um, to check the quality of the seeds, there should be some uh, valid sampling method, right? So is there any standard of how to sample the seeds from the field? If the field is bigger or smaller or different types of seeds, do they have different way of uh, sampling? ISDA do have standard procedure for sampling. Uh, usually it's not sampling straight from the field, but sampling after the seeds are cleaned and processed and already into the warehouse. There were, the business has already been done, right? <laughs> you already finished the business and then when you check it, I mean... Uh, unless it's for inspecting for disease. Then you require field inspection. And this will be done by the, the NPPO. It's, it's, the, it's the duty of the National Plant Protection Office. So 
we have to ask them to come to our field and do the inspection. And they, after the, the inspection, and they will certify it and put on the phyto certificate that this particular field is inspected and free of such and such a disease. This is, that is the question from the chat box. So how we can get high quality seeds from cross pollinated crops? Okay, cross pollinated crops, that the, the genetic purity of that, that is to, I got to really find out the question again. You mean producing a hybrid crop or? Okay, so that, that means you're producing a hybrid crop. So first, they got to be measured, make sure, you know, there's proper demasculation, mechanically or by hand or by some Genetical means like uh, cytoplasmic maturity or self incompatibility. And that is what we can do in the production. But, you know, like any biological system, nothing is foolproof. There can be variation. And, you know, CM is particularly self incompatible system can always break down under high temperature or undesirable conditions. So it is really up to the seed company to take care of this problem. And seed companies should have safeguards for doing this. One, they can do physical grow out in the field to make sure the crop is genetically, is the to hybrid or for many crops today now you can do PCR tests but usually we work with more than two markers to make sure the, the accuracy of the test so some companies will work up with ten, up to 10 pairs of our markers I have a question about liability uh, uh, Albert, uh, please, uh, can you hear me? Unmute yourself. Unmute. I think that I unmuted already. <laughs> yes, we're hearing you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My 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 question about liability is that how would the insurance uh, be helpful, and uh, how would the private and then the governmental? I know that the government always like uh, has some collaboration with the private sector. Would, 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 would the government be bailing you out or, or you have to rely on the insurance? And if, if you have to rely on the insurance, the premium, I would, I would think of a, a very astronomical number in that regard. Well, that's a very good question. Most seed companies are private, so the government do not care about our thus. They, because, you know, no matter how careful you are, you know, there can be always errors. Can be human error, can be mechanical mix up or anything. And the International Seed Federation do arrange for us to purchase errors and omission insurance. And so far, the premiums are not prohibited. Uh, you know, this is to ensure us against our mistake. But also at the same time, we do face unreasonable claims. Uh, many farmers will put the blame on the seed companies even though the crop is planted under, you know, poor weather conditions. And 
since the far, poor farmers are always poor, and the court is always on their side. And seed companies do have a very high risk in facing these unreasonable claims. And it's a huge risk. And what we tend to do is not only relying on insurance, but we relying on how to manage these claims. We, in the first case, we learn to deny the responsibility. There's no way out. The first thing is to go out there and pacify the farmers, pay them out before the fires spread everywhere. It's a, it's a very risky part on our business. So that's why we, we always a mix an extra step in checking our quality, including human error. Human error in mixing up the seeds. That is very risky. So Albert, do you have any suggestion for Anthony? So but in the legal point of view. I, I think that it really have to tie back with the government policy. I think that like like we have the so-called we have in the workplace, we have the so-called no fault insurance. It's being insured by whatever. If we, we're gonna promote this sort of seed business or whatever, I think that there's certain like treaty or, co or convention need to establish in order to promote this. But I, I would consider the, the little things that I know about the, the US situation. I'm a US patent attorney. I, I myself is a trained, uh, you know, with, with, with biology and, uh, and, and law. And, uh, and, uh, and I think that like, uh, you know, a lot of uh, agricultural part or whatever has been kind of ignored and being very dominated by several entities. For example, Monsanto. And, and we have always talked about the Monsanto scandal all the time in the US. So, uh, but, but I do think that not just the private sector, but I, but I think Anthony gave us, give, give me a very uh, good uh, 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 outlook at high level and then about managing the, the claim, meaning to settle with the poor farmer early. I think that is a great strategy, but the, the fight in court is, is not really the, the, the best mean. It, it's gonna hurt both sides. It's gonna hurt the farmer, it's gonna hurt the seed, producer and, and all. I think that uh, as a nation, I think that the national uh, level that, that I think that, that, that one have to really focus on that part. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. You know, since we are dealing with biological items of life, and there are always things that you never expect will happen, like the bacterial food watch and watermelon. That has cost Monsanto millions or billions in the US. Because nobody is aware of this disease and all of a sudden it show up. So that's why seeds sometimes has to be expensive because we have to factor that in. Okay, I received um, two questions from the chat box. So the first one is by Professor Mei Chi. So her question is, for the international organization NPPO, I suppose they set the standards for seed and certify them. So is the membership country based or is the membership dominated by certain countries? Are there any examples showing dispute in standard setting. So the question is, if the big countries set up all the standards, will they be favor, doing some favor for themselves? Well, see the membership in, uh, see the setting up of the standards is up to individual countries. So with the phytosanitary system, you know, this is the sovereign rights of each and every country. And, and one country cannot challenge the other country. And a lot of times the World Trade Organization will come in and try to 
arbitrage. But with China will not allow corn seeds for America, China has the sovereign right to do it. And they're still doing it. And it's not changing it because they say corn has a certain disease in America that China does not have. And this is valid, and nobody can challenge it. It's, it's each country setting the standards for their own country. We're not setting the standards for other countries. So, so this is not a case that you can really challenge. Like China has discovered brassica seeds from New Zealand that is contaminated with black rot. So they ban all the seeds of brassicas from New Zealand. So it's still up, up to it today. And the New Zealand say, okay, if you find black rot in our seeds, but I don't trust your test, can we go to a third party and have it verified? But then, as a sovereign state, China say no. We don't. We don't listen to any third party. We trust our own test. So, so each MPPO is independent, and they don't dominate any other countries. And also, certain, particularly from the smaller countries, because. The NPPO are not as educated. They will come up with crazy conditions with short notice. And this really is uh, upsetting for the trade. And, and we cannot challenge them. OK, so um, the next question is by Professor T.F. Chen. And his question is, how long does it take to get the seeds certified by, for example, ISTA lab? Uh, if it is just a simple case of germination and physical purity, moisture content, it's not long. Only, you know, you're talking about within a week, unless it's very high season and then you have to stay in line. And also, this certificate, it's only valid within two weeks of the export, of the shipping. So, um, Professor Chen, follow up the question is, so now that there's a lapse for, to do the certifications, and you have already mentioned that it's a short, short period of time for turning it over. So is there any urgent need for more lab in the world? I mean, do we need to build more lab for certification and why? And yeah, so that's the question. Well, first thing is the membership of ISDA is not cheap. It's quite expensive. And uh, usually most of the members are the national labs and private labs of the bigger companies. There's still many countries that do not have ISTA labs, and particularly in the less developed world. And it's really up to the country whether, you know, how important is the seed trade to them? How important is the seed export trade to them to warrant the establishment of a ISTA lab? So could I, um put it like this, right? So due to the sovereignty of each country, so they can adopt whatever standard they want. But some of the countries adopted the standard of ISTA, so you require that kind of certificate to export the seeds to those countries. And if you want to do business with those countries, you will need the ISTA certificates. Am I correct to say it? Yes. Uh Many countries will require ISTA certificates for seed imports, uh, particularly like in Africa, Europe, Middle East, they all do that. So like in Hong Kong, we do not have a ISTA lab. So basically, the, ex the trade with those countries is 
the law from, from us. Okay, so yeah, it's open for other questions. So the audience, please feel free to ask questions. Yeah, I, I have one for me. Hi. 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 <laughs> well, first of all, uh, Dr. Che, thank you very much for your very clear uh, presentation. Um, very briefly, my name is Michiel van Eyck. I'm CEO of GeneTwister Technologies, a company, biotechnology company based in Wageningen, the Netherlands, and owned by five uh, international horticultural and vegetable seed breeding companies. Um, I, and I was just wondering, um, what wishes do you have for uh, researchers, uh, well, including myself potentially, with respect to um, seed quality traits or you know, research that would benefit uh, the trade of, uh, of seeds. Is there anything we can contribute from your perspective? <laughs> well, I think, I think today, the trade really needs fast and accurate tests for new diseases. Uh, you know, new diseases are showing up all the time, and some of them, unfortunately, are seed-borne. And, you know, fast, accurate tests to determine these are very important to the trade. And, and so far, that's may, mainly done by companies individually, in your opinion, or? Uh, mainly done by private labs today, like Eurofins. Okay. There's an outfit in, uh, in Holland, but I just offhand, I, I cannot recall the name. But there are not too many labs that can do it particularly for like fruit watch and cucurbits, this brown recruits or potato spindle viroids. You know, all, all these are new diseases that spring up in the last 10 years. And, and so far we do not have good specific tests for them, conclusive tests. All right. Yes, thank, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. okay. The, my thing is, you, you, will your company develop some new diagnostic kits for the, for the industry? Because I think you are very good in those uh, genomic analysis. So is it possible to develop some multiplex uh, diagnosis kit for every, everybody to use? Um, well, sure. That, that is certainly a, a part of what, uh, well, also uh, my company is, is doing. Although in my experience, and that's also why I asked the question, I think uh, typically the breeding companies themselves uh, address these new emerging bottlenecks immediately, of course, because of it is in their immediate commercial interest. And our role as a, uh, as a technology uh, provider is indeed twofold, to, to develop better technologies that are capable of contributing to that cause, and maybe one, uh, one interesting example to, to mention there is, for example, nanopore sequencing. So the new handheld uh, devices that are uh, making it possible to uh, identify new uh, pathogens uh, without any prior knowledge in a very rapid fashion. So that could contribute to this, uh, let's say, these type of uh, uh, questions. Um, and um, so that's the technology development component. And, and the other side of it is indeed the unraveling of the, let's say, the molecular mechanisms of how resistances to such pathogens work. And that's more a research activity that requires more time, but uh, of course is also very important because if you are faster than a competitor to identify a new resistance gene to a newly emerging pathogen that uh, yeah, that helps, of course, uh, 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 restoring the commercial position. Um, yeah, that's I can, what I can say at the moment. 
Thank you. So, so I, I have a follow-up question maybe for Antonio and also Mathieu. So, so since the pathogen is so severe affecting the sea quality, is there any uh, international registry to register all those uh, significant pathogens for agricultural products so that people can start to develop multiplex dialysis kit? Is there anything like this happen? Uh, ISF has established a list of plant pests that are transmitted by seeds. Uh, because in the past, you know, the phytosanitary inspectors of each country, they, they just arbitrarily pick up the list and whether they are actually transmitted by the seeds is not necessarily true. So, so what the International Seed Federation has been doing in the past is working from a science-based data and try to pull up a list of pests that is that are transmitted by seeds, carried by seeds. There is such a list. So is it, is it um, fair to say this disease, the seed bone disease, is just like human being? There's a mutation over the time. Certain disease will just show up without any of us knowing, and it gets worse. <laughs> it passes around the world. They sure can. <laughs> and, you know, they can have different strains too you know, and specific to different areas. And makes life very difficult for the plant breeders and keep him working forever. Yeah. Yeah, that's very that's true. true. That there's a lot of purple types. So it's making everything difficult. So uh, will there be any question from our South African friends? <laughs> because I think you had to start your agricultural business, right? So since we have experts here, do you have any questions that you, will, you want to clarify? Yeah, well, um, hi. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, Lam and um, Dr. Anthony. My name is Ndiko Lutiti from the University of the Western Cape uh, in Cape Town, South Africa. I just wanted uh, to find out um, specifically uh, in the interest of small-scale farmers who don't have a big financial arm, so to say. Um, they often find that um, buying seeds from seed companies is quite expensive. And um, following on what, uh, what you have said about uh, poor farmers always remain poor, um, and that, that's, that, that to me reflects the situation of the small scale farmers. Are there any uh, efforts from uh, seed companies to empower small scale farmers who usually save seeds from their previous harvest so that they don't uh, have to buy the next set of seeds in the next season uh, to empower them so that they can uh, maintain good quality seeds that have the same attributes as those that you have pointed out, for example, in terms of uh, diseases and the, uh, quite in the physical quality of the seeds and so on, so that they have better germination in their next season if they save seed themselves rather than going to buy from the seed company again. Well, you, you know, seed companies are commercial outfits, so they... <laughs> They are not, you know, it's not their interest to promote seed savings. But there are other agencies like the Well Wedge, you know, that are actually helping small farmers and teaching them the basics of seed saving. Many, I mean, the hybrid crops, you cannot really save the seeds. 
but for all open pollinator crops, there's no reason why you cannot save the seed. As long as you have the, the appropriate weather conditions that are favorable to save good seeds. But of course, saving seeds is not a very simple matter and that does require some skill, but, but nothing very too difficult. We're not talking about some rocket science. And I think small holders can be trained and taught how to save seeds. But unfortunately, seed companies don't do that. These are done by more by NGOs. And I know Well Wedge is doing a good job in promoting that. So I would like to offer my suggestions to Tico. So for high quality seeds, there's always the economic of scale. So if you have a lot of seeds to produce, you can have all these uh, testing to ensure all the qualities and you'll get good product because of the good seeds. The existence of seed companies is not just getting the money from small farmers, but they also produce good quality seeds to allow the farmers to have better production. So I guess the best way to do it is if the small farmers can have some union or community, they can have their own seed, it's like a seed service. Then they can collaborate with the bigger seed company, but to learn from the big company or do some sharing so that you have your own community or society or whatever that will do a bigger scale. And there's a, there will be a particular group of people to produce good seeds. And then the farmer can focus on the production rather than asking the farmer to cultivate, make good seeds and do all the business. Sometimes a division of labor will be more efficient to, to, win, to, to have a win-win situation for everybody. I, I guess the, um, you may try to think of whether you get enough farmers join together to have a, a group of people really doing this for everybody in, in your country. I think that would be easier. And, and then you can have a collaboration agreement with some of the big seed company and see how everybody can win that way. But I, I, according to my experience in China, if everybody saving their seeds at the beginning seems to be very good. But then when you compare, when you compare whether you are growing your own seeds versus you get the good seeds from the company, it's not necessary that you, are, you earn more money. <laughs> because the good seeds always give you better harvest. That, that's my suggestion. I, I don't know whether Anthony or others will agree with me or not. Well, you know, since I'm from a family business, my father always taught me in the seed business, you don't make money off the farmers. It's our purpose and aim to help the farmers to make more money so that we can get a little bit back from them. So I think it's not a matter of the cost of the seeds, but it's a matter of providing the quality seeds and also seeds that are suitable for that specific location for the farmers. You know, you know, you know I've looked back some years ago you know, all the seeds that are available here in this part of the world are whatever the Europeans and Americans want to come to us, but not necessarily what is suitable for us. So with local breeding companies coming up now, then we have specific seeds varieties that are suited for our conditions. And that is, I think more important than just the price of seeds. So I think it's the duty of the seed company to provide the best suitable varieties for each locality. 
that's the only way we can help the local people to come up with the best crop. Yeah, I, I guess I agree with uh, Anthony that uh, it, it takes a lot of efforts to do research and optimize the system and for the seeds. So this is maybe a job of the seed company, but ultimately if their seeds can make the farmers earn more money than, their, than they, when they're keeping their own, that is no reason to refuse right, to earn more money. But I think local seed company is always a important balance. If all the seeds are controlled by a few big, com big countries, they may not fit the lead of the local groups. So as Anthony said, they are trying to help the local people to develop good seeds that suit their environment and their culture. That will certainly lead local people to participate. So if a South African friend would like to develop strong agricultural industry, I think, I think part of your young people should learn the seed technology and try to do the business themselves. That, that's, I, I hope that it will happen to you. Okay, so uh, is there any other questions that um, audience would like to ask? Any, any, anything in the chat box? Okay, so then uh, advertisement's time. <laughs> so Joanna, can you put up the poster? Okay, thank you everybody. So today we have a good uh, discussion. Thank you for your participation. So our next talk will be given by Professor Francisco Cisternas who is a professor in the business school of our university. And he will give a talk entitled, Digital Transformations Effects on Agricultural Products and Methods to Assess Market Trends. So we will change gear a little bit to see how marketing technology can help agriculture. And this is a new topic for most of us, I think, I, including myself, I have nothing, no knowledge about this at all. So if you are interested to see in the eyes of the marketing professor how agriculture can be profitable, please uh, register using the QR code here. And we will also mail, you the, mail to you the registration details since you are on our mailing list. Okay, so um, with that, uh, let's, let's thank uh, Dr. Anthony Che again. Thank you very much. <laughs> And thank all the audience for participating. And I just, after Francisco's talk, I just make some and some um, preview of what we will have, right? So we, uh, in, in March, there will be a talk on crop insect by Professor Jerome Hoy. And in April, there will be a talk by Professor in Hong Kong U on the culture related to soybean. So how soybean affects the Asian culture. I think that would be an interesting talk too. Okay, so I'm try also trying to uh, ask uh, other speakers. <laughs> Maybe some of them is already in the audience. I think McHill has agreed to give a talk to us. So we will arrange a time. I'm also asking Albert, <laughs> so who is a lawyer, <laughs> to give us some legal perspective of agriculture and more. I hope that this kind of exchange is beyond the barrier of geographical regions, although some of us may need to stay a little bit late, some are, uh, wake up in the morning. But I think it's very worthwhile, worthwhile to do this exchange. With, I, I do think that I learned a lot today from Anthony's um, uh, experience. He's very humble because um, to me he's a legendary people because he owns a piece of very expensive land in Hong Kong instead of selling it for real estate. He keep it for farm. That is kind of uh, uh, advice to most of the Hong Kong people. But his family and him is still doing that. And he, he do a lot of helps for 
most of us who are interested in narrow culture, his experience in Northwest China has stimulated me a lot. Over the last many years, he, he, he was one of the pioneers who teach the farmer in Northwest China to grow seeds, to increase the income by producing good seeds. By learning new technology, changing the knowledge, increase the knowledge, the farmer get better living. I think that is the way to do it. Instead of giving money to people, I think Anthony has actually given knowledge to the people and through the efforts of the local people, they change their livelihood by increasing the income. And it stimulates me a lot. So I'm trying to follow his footprint and do something all over China. <laughs> so, so with that, I, I think uh, we all learned something today and hopefully I will see you again in the next talk in February, which is more related to business, finance, and money, etc. Okay, so good night, everybody. Good night for those who are in Hong Kong, and I think good afternoon or whatever <laughs> to to the others. Okay, bye bye, bye bye, everybody. Bye -bye. <laughs>